Uh, welcome, folks. It's uh, mid-October. Uh, it's a terrific time out here in the desert. I hope you uh, are in, setting in a comfortable place, whether the climate's good or bad today. I hope you're ready to learn some things. It's a really, really exciting time, I think, in the uh, social-emotional learning space. Um, I suspect some of you may have even been at the conference in Chicago, the first uh, Castle SEL Exchange Conference. That was a dynamic event. Lots of interesting things going on in the SEL world. Some ways, it's kind of overwhelming. So I say that because uh, I think one of the jobs that I have, personal agendas I have, is to try to really simplify things. And so today's presentation is really at the heart, at the heart of all things SEL from my perspective. It's about teaching social emotional learning skills. And uh, I've taken advantage of 30 some years of research uh, with colleagues of mine um, and, uh, and focused on uh, the 10 top SEL skills that kids need to have to be effective at school and I think pretty much in life. My research is based on their lives in schools and, and particularly on achievements. So um, uh, set back and uh, um, as we uh, work today together, there's going to be four themes that I want to emphasize. First theme is teach skills that matter. Teach skills that matter. Uh, matter uh, in terms of the, the social successes and academic successes of students uh, ages uh, from, based on my research, 3 to 18. Second, focus on improvement. So we're going we're gonna to think about measuring what we teach and uh, trying to build an evidence base around that to make, get, be certain that what we're doing is effective. So we have to look for improvement. We have to look, measure for change. And that usually means we have to measure prior to teaching and following teaching. Third is um, the teaching that we do. And I'm, and I'm very confident a large majority of you turning in today, tuning in today are highly effective teachers. You, you care about teaching, as evidenced by being on this session, you are, or you support teachers and you care that they do a great job. Part of, part of sound teaching is learning from other people and reading or, trans, or, or having people help translate research that's effective. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, an evidence-based program um, that is effective. And in fact, it, it has some of the attributes that um, are summarized by the acronym or abbreviation SAFER, S-A-F-E-R. I'll unpack that as we go along today. So finally, um, all good teachers evaluate their practices. All good school psychologists and counselors evaluate their practices in some way. I'm going to suggest some uh, ways that have a decent amount of rigor so that one can get a sense of, of the degree of improvement that happens. So those are themes that are going to be there. Um, there's, uh, there's several learning objectives that are there in front of you. Uh, review definitions so that we're on the same page as we communicate. Examine approaches to how we screen children. Uh, to identify strengths and weaknesses, because we want to we want to uh, use that data to influence what we teach, as well as a baseline for this beginning of getting a, a sense of change or improvement. Uh, I want to showcase. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to talk about ten skills, but I'm going to showcase two skills in particular: how to get along with others, and stay calm with others. Think about that: how to get along with others and stay calm with others. Um, if you would just reflect for just a second or two, get along with others, what, what, what's happening as you think about that? What are kids doing? Um, what skills do they have to have to get along? Stay calm with others. There's some skills there, and that kind of triggers a lot of aspects around emotion. What do kids have to do in order to stay calm with others? Okay. So um, then I'm going to... Uh, illustrate these two skills in an evidence-based intervention program called the Classified Intervention Program, SIP for short, okay? There's quite a bit of data building on this. This is a, a program that also has been recognized by CASEL, and it meets its highest standards in terms of evidence base. Um, so it's a CASEL Select, S-E-L-E-C-T program, as they call it. 
And finally, I want to talk about what it takes, what, what you have to go through to use this program. It's not that much because many of you are already doing this quite well. So um, as support of this presentation, uh, as Sherry indicated at the outset, each of you when you signed up um, should have got, but if you haven't, uh, you will be able to get two intervention briefs that we've written about, literally about one, about doing nice things for others. So that's another one of the top 10 skills. Uh, this, this is a two or three page uh, research to practice translated document. And then there's another one called teaching children to own their actions. Uh, responsible decision making. Okay. So there, there are a number of other briefs like this. I hope you find these useful. And if you do, I encourage you then go to the Pearson website um, and you can find uh, eight additional ones. And I'm working on more uh, almost as I speak today to share with you. Okay. So here we go. Uh, in my mind, this is one of my uh, favorite definitions. There are different definitions of social emotional learning, but social emotional learning is defined by Maurice Elias and Dominique Mosseri as, as the process of acquiring knowledge, skills, attitudes, and beliefs to identify and manage emotions. Certainly staying calm is an example of that. Secondly, to care, to care about others. Okay? How to get along is an example of that component of SEO. To make good decisions, to behave ethically and responsibly, and to develop positive relationships and avoid negative behaviors. There's a lot there. It's a big definition, and I guess that's one of the challenges of, of, of teaching SEL skills, but it's one of the, uh, the powerful aspects of it. When we think broadly, when we have clear vision of what skills bring this, this definition to life, we can have a, quite an impact on how people interact uh, with other people and how they think and feel about themselves as they interact. So there we go. So SEO competencies, an overview of these skills. Uh, a lot of people are aware of the CASEL model. If you're not, I encourage you to get aware of it. It is um, based on the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning. Uh, it's a theoretical model that worked by myself and others now have now grounded it as an empirical model as well. It looks at social emotional learning and emphasizes five areas of functioning. The first area is self-awareness, the ability to accurately recognize one's emotions and thoughts and how they influence behavior. The second area is self-management the ability to regulate one's emotions, thoughts, and behaviors effectively in different situations, okay? self-management. Third is social awareness, the ability to take the perspective of and empathize with others from diverse backgrounds and cultures, to understand social and ethical norms for behavior, and to recognize family, school, and community resources and support. Really important one. Actually one that challenges a lot of young students because of the need to develop the cognitive skills to be able to empathize with other people. It's important. Fourth area, relationship skills. The ability to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships with diverse individuals and groups. Okay? Clearly there's, this includes communicating, listening, cooperating, uh, resisting inappropriate social pressure, negotiating conflict, and seeking and offering help with other people, really important package of, of skills uh, in this area, this relationship competency. And finally, responsible decision making, the ability to make constructive and respective choices about personal behavior, social interactions based on ethical standards, safety concerns, social norms, et cetera. So that's uh, the landscape, um, that's the context in which I want to talk about 30 skills, make you aware of 30 skills, talk about 10 skills, okay? So these 30 skills that um, are part of the SSIS class-wide intervention program. Today we're going to talk about our core 10 skills. Listen to others, say please and thank you, follow the rules, pay attention to your work, ask for help. Five of them. Take turns when you talk, get along with others, stay calm with others, do the right thing, do nice things for others. Uh, we're going to focus on those 10. The intervention work with this program has focused on those 10. Um, there are uh, 10 skills that um, over the years we've done research with over 8,000 
parents, two occasions about 4,000 parents in 1990 and 2006, and then uh, about 2,500 teachers in 1990 and again in 2007, about another 2,000 teachers. Collectively, nearly 10,000 adults that have had children between the ages of 3 and 18 have weighed in and looked at a long list of, of social emotional skills and, and rated how important they were to functioning in school and at home. And consistently, 10 or 11 of them, there's high consensus amongst adults that influence children's lives. And, and those are the 10 that I'm referring to as the top 10. Okay? Research has shown that they matter, okay? And I'll say a little bit more about that as we go forward. We're going to talk about uh, these skills and talking about teaching these skills in the context of, of a, a support system framework that's commonly across many, many states referred to as a multi-tiered support system. The session today is really going to talk about tier one, or many people refer to as a universal level, because that involves all students. And it involves almost all teachers as a result, too. So um, I, what I want to highlight, though, is what is done in Tier 1 with regard to the SSIS products, the assessments and the intervention program that I'm going to talk about, can be replicated, reused in Tier 2 and Tier 3. Say a little more about it as we go along, um, but uh, we're going to talk through this today uh, from the perspective that's the most inclusive of all teachers, basically, and all students couple observations. Tier 1, as I just said, really involves all students and probably a vast majority of teachers. Tier 1 is, a, is central to, should be, to the values and culture of a school, given it includes all kids and virtually all teachers. Here's one. Think about this. Every teacher in Tier 1 has approximately 70,000 minutes of instructional time per year. That's a lot of time, actually. Now, most of us feel quite conversely. We don't have enough time to teach. But, uh, and I'm very time conscious. I start with this. I'm going to come back to this number as we go a little further along. Because you're going to care about how much time is it going to take me to teach these skills. Okay? That's a legitimate question, a legitimate concern. Every teacher in Tier 1, though, already teaches FEL skills every day. You do, you do, you do, you do it. But it usually is, a, in, a, in effect, a hidden curriculum. What I mean by that, it's not like it's a secretive curriculum, but that it's not done explicitly, nor often is it done in coordination with other teachers and colleagues and students around you. There's power in, in teachers being sort of on the same page and having a shared vision about what skills matter and what they teach. The good news is, though, as an adult standing up in front of a classroom, as a school psychologist working in front of a group of students or a school counselor working with, in, with, with a group of students who have friendship difficulties. And you are a model. You are demonstrating. You are telling, showing, and doing what it takes to exhibit social emotional skills effectively almost all the time. The issue is, now let's get on the same page. Let's make it explicit. Let's hold students accountable for learning from us and, and we all know there's some students that need more than, uh, the, than what you typically do through a, through a modeling uh, process in front of the classroom that's not labeling certain skills. So this is achievable to teach these skills. And what we do in Tier 1 can be repeated in Tier 2 and Tier 3. Sometimes it needs to be supplemented with additional support. But in many cases, Tier 2 is largely giving kids more time, more opportunities to respond, more feedback, more practice with the same skills, many of them in Tier 1. So, so let's get going. We're going to, well, here we are. we got this young man flexing his muscles, so to speak. Um, everyone talks about SEL as being strength-focused, okay, uh, in effect, that, that means we want to think about improving desired behaviors so, so people can become strong, okay? But let me just put a little note here. Uh, I, I often hear people say, well, that means we don't want to, you know, single people out and say they've got this as a weakness. 
I, I differ a little bit about that. We have to know our relative strengths and weaknesses. All of us have them, okay? All of us have relative strengths, and we have some things that are relatively weak. And by understanding that, we can allocate instructional time appropriately. I'm not saying let's ignore strengths. We, we want to give people opportunities to continue to develop those strengths, frankly. But we also want to make sure that we, we allocate time and feedback and opportunities to practice where people have relative weaknesses. Okay? So SEL, from, from the perspective of the SSIS program, is about identifying strengths and weaknesses of desired behaviors and then allocating resources to help kids develop and improve those. Both continue to improve strengths and, and to address weaknesses. Okay? SEL, skill, SEL skills that matter and a theory of action behind them. Okay, so I've already kind of done the read here on the ten, top 10 skills. Give you a second to look at it. And, and now what I want to do is also draw attention to how these specific skills, listen to others, actually is part of one of the castle subdomains, self-management. Say please and thank you. It's a, a subdomain of relationship skills. Follows the rule, self-management. Um, today, we're going to focus on get along with others, a relationship skill, and stay calm with others. I picked these two partly because they're, they're uh, things that I think everybody needs to have in their repertoire, little kids and adults as old as I am, 67 years old, sitting here talking to you about this. These are things that I continue to work on in my life. Um, and I point this out. I point this out because... It's not just the skill that we have to think about. It's the social application of those skills, okay? Yes, these are top ten skills. And note, I haven't yet said, oh, these are skills for first graders, or these are skills for second graders, or for middle schoolers. They, in fact, are skills that all of those kids, and an old adult like myself, needs to be attentive to because what we find ourselves is as we move through school and through life, Social situations, new social demands occur where we have to apply these skills. The SIP program is all about teaching a fundamental set of skills, 30 skills, but also being mindful that you need to apply those skills in multiple situations. So it's, there's, it's a little misleading to look at the SSIS SIP program and say, oh, it only teaches 30 skills, or the core skills they focus on only 10. It's actually those are multiplied by the many situations that you're in. I'm going to come back to this more, but I want you to think about it. And as educators, you're sitting out there, I want you to think when I'm talking about get along with others, try to identify four or five high frequency situations where kids have to do this in your class, in your school. Those are situations then that need to be part of any intervention program to teach these skills. So it's about skills that matter and about their application in fundamental situations. Okay? So I've already kind of said a little bit about this slide when I was warming up to get you going on the top 10 skills. Here they are again, those 10 skills. I do suggest they get taught in this order, although it's not a, a, an absolute requirement. But let's just look here for a second. When we say get along with others, if you go back up the list, Getting along with others is about listening to others. It's about, it's, it often is about saying please and thank you. It's often about paying attention to your own work and not bothering other people when they're trying to work. It's often about taking turns. So uh, what I hope you see is that there is a sequence and that the, the more advanced skills in the list, get along with others, stay calm with others, build off of those skills. Okay? Now, it's a, there's a learning progression. Just like, although it's much clearer in mathematics, much clearer in, in, in reading, there are known progressions that we go through. So that's one of the parts of a, of a really good curriculum that's kind of getting at the S and that safer, sequenced. Okay? There are a, these are really, by definition, adult-pleasing behaviors, but they're also, this is what surprises people, surprise me back in the late 1990s when I was doing research. It surprised me 
These are also academic enabling behaviors. Let me elaborate up on that a little bit. So this visual, okay, um, this is actually from a research article by Jim DePerna, Rob Volpe, and myself, published in 202. And, we, and this is about reading achievement, but we also looked at math achievement as well and published another article in 205 on that. But what am I trying to say here? This is the research that shows how interpersonal skills, at the time that's what we called them, we didn't call them SEL skills then, and some people still refer to them as such. A lot of, a lot of SEL work thinks about intrapersonal and interpersonal. Well, in this case, we were looking at five interpersonal skills, okay? getting along with others as well. Okay? And what we learned is that children who had higher levels of interpersonal skills actually had better reading achievement. But, you know, what? How's that work? Teach interpersonal skills, it improves reading. Well, here's how it works. Interpersonal skills influence motivation which in, in, to, to learn, which in turn influences engagement and in taking advantage of opportunities to learn that teachers generate in a classroom. And this is, by the way, this data is with uh, early elementary kids. And in turn, that had dividends in terms of reading. I'm going to say more about this, but let's just make it perfectly clear. I'm not suggesting that if you teach interpersonal skills, it makes kids smarter. It just makes them better able to take advantage of the learning opportunities that teachers create, okay? That's the power of it. Just think about it. Just think about this in terms of the minutes that you have to teach. Every minute that, that you can minimize having to deal with classroom management behavior problems, conversely, every minute that you can get kids to be more engaged, to work together better, to listen and take advantage of learning opportunities, that aggregates over across the, the 180 some days of school that kids are there that you have an opportunity to teach. So that's the power. That's the academic enabling power to these SEL skills. They're good in and of themselves. It's great to have kids get along, but it's also great to have kids get along that, that getting along translates to more learning. Okay? So this is the, the theory side of this. I, I learned a long time ago, and, it, and I kind of snickered when I learned this initially, but there's nothing more practical than a good theory. There isn't. So you've got to have you, – there's a theory of action behind this program, and, and we're going to talk about the left side of this, the highlighted box side. And that's where you and I are action involved. That's where intervention materials are involved. So you can see the resources. There's school leaders, there's teachers, there's assessment tools, there's intervention materials, and there's a facility that we're setting up. Um, uh, and I don't mean to be demeaning to school psychologists, the counselors, et cetera. I, you, you can be part of that resource family, too. You absolutely are, particularly when we start getting into Tier 2 and Tier 3. Uh, there's activities that we do. That's the, the essence of engaging uh, and, and stimulating students through the instructional framework. We do some things with parents. Parents are not centrally involved in this program currently that I'm going to talk about, uh, other than they can be involved in terms of uh, assess assessment aspects, if you wish. There's outputs that we have, um, school-wide creating an awareness school. Some people actually have these FDL programs embedded in sort of an initiative around school climate and uh, safety and health and, and uh, some positive support. Um, but from uh, my uh, work, by and large, you're going to hear today, it's really around good screening, good screening results, uh, detailed lessons that, that, that teachers can use and engage students in, and then following those lessons, uh, generalizing those skills through creating opportunities to apply them in the classroom. I'll say more about that. The expectations, though, this is why we're here, though, is What's the payoff? And the payoff I've listed as short-term outcomes, increased SEL skills, intermediate outcomes. We see many problem behaviors decrease as well as classroom environment improvements as a result of problems decreasing, better management for classrooms. And then it's more long-term. And I don't mean, you know, five years later. I'm talking end of year, uh, more or less. Increases in engagement for sure happens fairly early. Increases in achievement takes time. More detailed characterization of this, and this comes right out of the SSIS uh, classroom intervention, SIP research work, not
not that I've done, but that independent evaluators have done. This visual it brings to life what I refer to as the SIPS triple positive theory of action. Okay? What is that? In, in effect, it says that if you do the classroom intervention program that I'm going to highlight today, and there are 10 skills, you could do it in 10 weeks. Some people take 12 weeks. Some people take 14 weeks to do it. That's not the magical part of this. The issue is covering these skills, giving kids opportunities to learn these skills and uh, for a, a, an entire classroom. And if that happens, we consistently find, particularly in elementary schools, that the SIP increases frequencies of SEL skills, these 10 skills, decreases frequencies of problem behaviors, which influence key academic behaviors and can lead to increases in reading and, in some cases, mathematics achievement. If you, if you study this program a bit, too, you're going to say, yeah, it's pretty language loaded. Kids get to talk. Kids get to inter in interact, et cetera. They're going to learn some new words. Uh, their vocabulary is going to increase. Well, that's kind of fundamentally English language learning, uh, 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 front and center. So um, don't get too nervous, folks, about taking time away from academics. Given what we know about these 10 behaviors, it's valuable time away from academics because it's likely to enhance over time uh, in achievement engagement. So it's, it's got a return on investment, is what people are bearing with me. Now, that was an illustration. It wasn't intentional, but it was, it was staying calm with others. <laughs> so let's keep moving. Uh, got, got to have a sense of humor, too, um, whenever uh, you're doing stuff like this. But uh, on a serious note, I was talking about the six-phase step that every lesson unit in the SIP program has, tell and show are largely teacher driven. Teachers are talking to students, defining aspects of, of terms and steps. Um, they're modeling and showing students how to, uh, to stay calm with others or how to get along with others. Each one of these has multiple steps. Then there's this do and the practice phases. Together, they are all about getting kids uh, engaged. In some cases, it's about getting kids up and doing things, okay? Uh, a small group of kids with some guided sort of uh, help to, to illustrate how they would use a skill in a high-frequency situation. And then there's the practice phase. That's all kids. And in the practice phase, you'll see that we use role-play cards and role-play situations that are typical of school classrooms, okay? Um, I'm going to encourage each of you to scrutinize those role-plays because I believe in many cases you'll be able to add role plays or modify these role plays to make them more authentic and, and, and appropriate to your students. Finally, we're going to ask every single student to say, how am I doing? Let's monitor the pro your progress. Okay? And by the way, if, you, if you're working in a school with a castle model where self-awareness is an important skill, we in effect with this monitoring progress has, have a self-awareness component to every skill. And we try to highlight uh, to students to think about, reflect about yourself, reflect what you're doing well, and what you need to work on. And finally, there's a generalization component, which is uh, kind of the, yes, it's the last of the six steps, if you will, but it's also thinking about how can I use this skill outside of my classroom? How can I use this skill in a lunchroom, in, uh, on the bus? at home. And I, I will tell you that most people seem to minimize the importance of generalization, partly because they may run out of time. Don't. Manage your time so you can teach generalization. So each lesson is designed for about 25 to 30 minutes, and with three lessons per skill unit, it takes about 90 minutes, slightly less than 90 minutes per week. Okay? Remember, I told you I cared about time. And if you start thinking about 10 skills, 90 minutes, that's 900 minutes. Sounds like a lot of time, but it's only 1.2 or 3% of the school year. 1.2 or 3% of the total you have 70 minutes to teach. So a very small investment in time you can teach using a structured process, a sequence, sequence process, They'll show you practice and progress monitor to teach skills. Okay? So the, this is a manual. 
uh, that, uh, that, that, that has scripts in it, okay? It's, you know, my mom would look at this and say, well, it's a cookbook. It's got scripts. You follow the script, right? That's right. The first couple times you do things, I strongly encourage you to follow the scripts for teaching a skill. Just like the first time you use a recipe, you follow it closely. As you get comfortable, as you get feedback from using this with students, you'll start making some modifications. But I encourage you to follow the six overall steps in every script. Tell, show, do, practice, monitor progress in general. So the only piece of paper that you really have is this manual. Everything else is online. Okay? It's downloadable. You access this. Uh, at a website that you get once you purchase a manual. And I hope you can see here, and I'm going to illustrate, um, that there is a digital lesson. All of the lessons in this manual, there are 23 currently, and I just added seven more, so now we're dealing with 30. They're all digitized as PowerPoints. They're all animated. In addition, there are support materials that I'll illustrate. We call them student uh, skill step cue cards, role play cards, and there are videos illustrating, in many cases, not all, but many, a positive example of the behavior and a negative example of the behavior. None of the negative examples are violent or vulgar, but they are strong enough to give people stimuli to look at. In many ways, these are used for kids to look at and to be to critique and sort of say, this is what the child did well in this situation. This is what the child didn't do so well in this situation. Um, and in addition to these, these materials for get along with others, there are a series of additional support materials. And I'm going to illustrate these as we go through. Some of them are letters to parents in English and Spanish. Uh, some of them are certificates of award. You don't have to use certificates if you don't want to recognize students' accomplishments from this program, but you can. Okay? So uh, moving forward, these are four pages. That's it. This is lesson one. Lesson one for gets along with others. And, and so lesson two would be another four pages. Lesson three would be another four pages. So to teach get along with others, three lessons, 12 pages of text, you would use these to, I would use these to, to, to prepare myself to teach a lesson so I know where I'm at. But understand you're going to have a PowerPoint to go along with these that in many ways will structure, follow the exact same structure that you have in the manual. In addition, these screened areas with green screening are summaries of what's on the video. So you'll be able to preview the video. Ideally, you should see the video but it will also allow you to preview the video as well. Okay? So here's the, here, here are all the materials. The centerpiece presented first, the PowerPoint slides. Okay? There's about uh, uh, 30, 35 slides for all three units. That tells you there's about 12 slides per unit, per lesson. Excuse me. Um, every lesson has a, uh, a cue card that we encourage you to download and post in the room. These are the steps for getting along with others. Think, talk, do, and smile. There's a, uh, a motion cue card that the whole program is based upon and getting kids to recognize uh, in themselves and in others six fundamentals. These are the fundamental uh, emotions that people feel. There's hundreds, admittedly, that we can label. Afraid, mad, elated, happy, nervous, sad. We ask kids to actually, whenever possible, and I know this varies across age groups and across ability groups, but we ask them to have their own what we call a student engagement record. And um, I'm going to talk a little more detail about that, but this is downloadable. This is something that most, most users would produce one per student in their classroom. It's one page videos, and role play cards. And uh, I'll show you more. There's actually six role plays per skill unit. So if you're following this, each skill unit, there's at least six situations we want kids to be able to apply, get along with others. The core, though, is this PowerPoint slide. On the left-hand side of the PowerPoint, you can see this colored grid. That's actually an abbreviated uh, script for the user. 
whether it be a teacher, counselor, school psychologist. On the right-hand side is, is where we want students to focus. It's fine if students look at the teacher script, no problem. They're going to learn some additional things. But um, so this is uh, how it's managed. To my knowledge, it's the only SEL program, it's actually the only intervention program um, that's been evidence-based that utilizes PowerPoints. The level of engagement, because in, in prior to this, we actually did not use PowerPoints. We've studied this. The level of student engagement and interest is maximized with these PowerPoints. Okay? So, stay for now. Let me unpack that word as I've illustrated a bit of what's in the class-wide intervention program. Safer means it's sequenced. There's connected and coordinated sets of activities. Okay, remember, tell, show, do, et cetera. It's active. The do and the practice are definitely active forms of learning. Getting kids to use the student engagement record is another example of an activity engaged. It's focused. There's components to develop personal or social skills. It's focused. That cue card uh, with the steps for get along with others breaks things down, focuses. And it's very explicit. Okay? It targets specific social and emotional skills. Oh. When you also add in this notion of responsiveness, which I'll illustrate more as we go through this, making this program responsive by customizing the role plays using our structure, but customizing the role plays, okay? Thinking about generalization, that sixth step in each lesson, and, and how you can create opportunities outside of these lessons at your school and encourage outside of school where people use the skill, that's making this responsive. So that's why we call it a safer program. Okay? Council aspires to having people have safe programs, we agree with that, and we take it a step further. We want your program, we want you to use the SIP in a way that makes it even safer. Okay? So let's teach a skill, okay? Let's teach a relationship skill. And now what I'm going to do is, is flash in front of you, not too fast, but nevertheless uh, keeping good pace to get through this today. Um, I want to highlight um, the, relation, the skill of get along with others. Now, some of you will laugh. Some of you will laugh at me. I used to be a faculty member at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. That's where I fell in love with country music. Hopefully some of you enjoy country music. I refer to this as the Kenny Chesney skill, okay? Some of you know, some of you know and could even sing along with me his song, Get Along. Remember, it says, get along and down the road. We've got a long way to go. Scared to live and scared to die. We ain't perfect, but we try. And then the, the song is, get along while we can. Always give love the upper hand. Paint a wall, learn to dance. Call your mom, buy a boat, drink a beer, maybe drink a beverage. Uh, sing a song, make a friend. Can't we all get along? <laughs> anyway, folks, a little humor there. But this is, besides being a, a good skill that all of us need to have, it's a skill we can be effective at teaching. So get along with others means talking in nice voices to each other, sharing space and materials, taking turns, and playing well together. People who get along are said to cooperate. So um, this is uh, the intro slide. In many cases, they start with what's happening. It starts with a picture. Um, and I'm going to show some of the other pictures we use. This is fairly, for fairly young children, admittedly, but there are pictures that are more age-appropriate for older children. Then, it, then we get in and we unpack the skill. What are the skill steps? So we always, we're really, in effect, teaching skill steps. Step one is think about what you do to get along with others. Step two, it, and then there's literally the, the, this is the good opportunity to post the cue card. Okay, and to hand out the engagement record because we're going to want students to write on their engagement uh, record the, the unit that they're studying, get along with others, put their name on it, and, uh, and start actually writing down as much as they can the core components of the steps. Okay? Step two, talk nicely with others, uh, talk nicely so others listen to you and know what you want, that you want to be included. Step three, do something nice to or with others to show you can get along. That's, it. That's a lesson in itself. What are, what are five things you can do that are nice that people like? Okay. 
Step four, smile. Show people that you are friendly and have positive feelings about them. Smile is a powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing. Sounds silly. Everyone knows how to smile. Getting people to think about using the power of their smile. Even when you're saying negative things sometimes to people, smiling can reduce problems. So, um, uh, the student engagement record, we ask kids to write in this space these skill steps. Okay? We continue into the tell phase. Okay, that's the first phase. Why is it important to get along with others? And so we engage kids to get their answers as much as possible here. Um, and, and then eventually we illustrate three possible reasons why it's important. Helps you make friends, increases cooperation with others, makes others feel good about you. Okay. So then we move into the show phase. The hallmark of the show phase are videos, okay, illustrating positive, if you will, and potential negative situations. Um, these are student actors. They're mostly fourth, fifth grade actors um, in these uh, videos. Um, they're not designed to actually teach you how to do the skill. They're designed to get you to think about the skill. They serve as stimulus and in many ways can be shown multiple times. They only last about 30 seconds, 40 seconds. But to get kids to, to take a role, for example, you might ask some students, please play the role of the young lady in the, with a the pink sweater that seems to be kind of having a tug of war with this boy in the blue shirt. If you were the girl in the pink sweater, how would you feel? What would you say? If you were the boy, what would you say, et cetera? So uh, they're really designed to get kids to have a safe way to be, to be a critics, if you will, to analyze the behavior of other people without picking upon a classmate, per se, or having a classmate feel like they picked upon. So then we move into the do phase. This is where we have kids, usually with a, the leadership of a teacher or a school counselor or a school psychologist, uh, a small group of kids, two or three, up in front of their classroom to enact uh, a situation. So here's a situation one, situation two, situation three. So you can see how as the leader of the classroom, whether you be teacher or counselor or psychologist, you're, you're ideally going to be asking several students, probably six or seven, to role play with you situations. And then you're going to move to the practice phase that engages everybody in those situations. And in the practice phase, we want people to solve role play situations, like I'm illustrating here, right? utilizing the four-step process of getting along with others. Okay? These role plays that I've highlighted here you may look at and say, yeah, it's not quite right for my school or for my classroom. So modify to re make these uh, so that they're authentic. And in, in this way, you'll be responsive to your students' needs. Okay? You can create, I've seen places where people create another six, eight, ten role plays over time because they actually want to teach these skills and repeat teaching these skills a bit. So the best way to refresh the program, to expand the program, to teach for generalization is to increase the number of role play situations you have. Okay? So um, moving forward, the next phase is the monitor progress phase. This is a standard visual that we have in virtually all of the skill units. We ask kids, how are you doing? How well do you think you get along with others? Use this four-step ladder to evaluate yourself. What wrong are you on? Are you on the bottom rung? Are you on the top rung? It's not so much that kids are perfectly accurate here. It's to get them to reflect and to give a, an explanation of their personal rating. And, and in many ways, too, I've seen really good teachers use this to say, let's just step back and think about where the whole class is at. Are we, are we a top rung class on this skill, or do we have room to improve? So, this is a very concrete framework to get kids to think about how well they're doing. And we also ask them to put it on their personal student engagement form to keep a record from lesson one, two, and three. I know that's hard to read, but we want kids to have a record of how they're doing each week. 
We want them to be accountable, first and foremost, to themselves for reflecting and also sharing occasionally with the teacher about how they're doing or the psychologist. The last phase is the generalization phase. And this is all about getting kids to think about how they've used the skill outside of the classroom, other places in school, at home, in the community. Okay? In this case, how can you get along with others who are much older than you, speak another language than you, wear different clothes than you, have different skin color than you? Those things may be all part of your class, but they also may be outside of your class. So we want people to think about that and how can you apply the skill? Oh, that's, that, that's information that can go on the bottom. We don't leave a lot of space, but flip this page over and ask kids to write about it. You're not probably not going to ask first and second graders to write a lot about it, but third, fourth, and fifth graders sure can, can write up a storm about using these and, and addressing some of these situations. Some of the units end with what we call a summary point, where we kind of pull it all together and deliver a, deliver a message, ultimately, that, that the student is in control. So this says you are in control of getting along with others. You are in control. Start getting along and don't stop. So we use a lot of mechanical things, buttons like this, start and stop. Getting along with others is an important relationship skill. So you just saw lesson one. Now, lesson two, I'm only going to sample now from lesson two. Lesson two in virtually all units shifts into thinking much more about emotions. It's where we use this emotion cue card. That doesn't mean we don't talk about emotions in lesson one, but we put a premium on this now that we've defined a skill, we've defined situations, and we can start talking about um, how you feel, how it makes you feel when others don't get along with you, etc. Uh, there's a fair amount of perspective taking that has to be developed in these skills and, and labeling and recognition of emotions. And of course, a lot of emotion, not all, can be shown with one's face. But as units evolve over time, we start actually talking about hands, about body posture, and a number of other ways to demonstrate emotion. Another aspect, how do you feel when people get along with you, registering emotions. Um, next, um, we, we also want to, I'm, I'm illustrating lesson three now, so I've jumped from lesson two. So if you're following this, lesson one took about 25 to 30 minutes. Some people would do that on a Monday. Lesson two follows the same six-step process, a little more emphasis on emotion in that. Lesson three is um, a repeat, okay? Now you go, whoa, we're going to go through the same things? Yeah, we are. Uh, some kids miss the lesson. Some kids need an, an extra dose. If you start thinking about the role plays and the, um, the guided role plays in front of the classroom, through a three-lesson session set, set up, you can have many students up in front of the class. You can have all students doing practice of these skills. That's where the power is getting kids to apply the skills and to think forward about how they're going to use these skills in different situations. Okay. So let's get along with others. Um, we wrap it up with a reminder that they're in control, that it's a relationship skill, and uh, it can affect how you feel about yourself and how others feel about you. Um, primary and secondary focus of these lessons, note that Unit 7 explicitly focused on relationship skills and getting along, but it secondarily, secondarily had aspects of self-awareness, the progress monitoring component, and the self-managing component is almost always brought in on a summary about self-control, that you're in control. So, yeah, um, we are trying to teach relationship skills but also concurrently with almost every unit, there's a, there's a secondary aspect of self-awareness and self-management. So, Chris, let me ask. Questions popping up that I need to address, uh, not, not about my technology skills now, but about the skills of SEL. Uh, no, Steve, there's, uh, there's no questions. No questions. 
Does that mean you're answering them all, Chris, as we go along? I've answered a few, yes. <laughs> okay, good on you. Good on you. Okay, well, I'll keep pressing forward. So we have about 15 minutes, 16 minutes left. Um, I want to highlight another skill, uh, you know, largely to reinforce what I've already said. Okay, here you are. you got the man. If you're going to teach Stay Calm with others, you're going to go to Unit 8 in the manual. You're going to find that there's about 12 pages in there, three lessons, four, four pages per lesson. And then you're going to find that you're going to want to access the online resource site to, to get access to the digital, uh, the PowerPoints, to the cue cards, to the role play cards, and to the videos. Okay. By the way, we are in the process of embedding all the videos in the PowerPoint. It's going to save one set of motions for all users. That should be done by mid-November. So these are all going to be highly integrated, even more efficient and more effective for your use. You will have to be online in order to do that. Okay. So same setup, same sort of uh, uh, script. Uh, if you look closely at this script, it, it, it tells you the do phase, what you say and do, the show phase, etc. Okay. Here we go. Stay calm with others. Shouldn't surprise you. We start with the tell phase. We start with a picture. We try to engage kids. What's happening in this picture? And we concurrently define the skill that we're going to teach. Staying calm with others means we don't get mad or lose our temper with other people. Rather, we think about our feelings. We stay relaxed. And we talk things out so everyone can work and play well together. Okay. And um, so um, we have a cue card for that. We're getting the same, the same emotion cue card. So you're not going to have to repeatedly download the emotion cue card. It's the same cue cards. That is. We've got the uh, record, uh, engagement record we want kids involved in. We've got videos for this one, positive and negative. Okay. And what else? We've got uh, role play cards. And again, I really encourage you to preview the role play cards and think about, do they fit my students? Should I be modifying these so that they're more authentic and more responsive to situations right here, indigenous in my school? Okay. Tell phase, jumps and asks you a question. Why is it important to stay calm? Now, I'm showing you after this normally would be animated where you would just simply see the question mark in a blank screen, more or less, and ask kids to raise their hand and give you some reasons. But ultimately, if uh, you, you can pose these three as good reasons for staying calm. And like the previous slide, there's a four-step process. There's a feel step. There's a think step. There's a do step. And um, a talk step, excuse me, and a do step. And then we want children to translate these to their engagement form. There's the four steps. These are the steps that we're going to use in the, uh, to analyze the videos in the show phase. These are the steps we're going to do, um, use in the do phase and the practice phase. Okay. Here's the situation in a guided role play. This would occur in front of the classroom. Usually the teacher or school psychologist would be organizing this. Three students are playing a game during free time. One student's not following the rules, et cetera. So getting kids up in front of the classroom. So if, if you're following this video, sort of keeps it away from your students, your classroom for a few minutes, then real life in front of the classroom, and then moving to the practice session. This is the noisy part. This is where kids are up and moving, okay? This is where kids are practicing. Each of these steps, by the way, takes about, you can do the math, but it takes about four or five minutes. I would err on the side of giving a little more time for practice. Whoever the user is, teacher, school psychologist, et cetera, needs to move about the room to observe some of these. So it takes maybe a little more time. And particularly the first couple of units take a little longer because kids get into the routine. But the, remember that that do phase, you want to model for how to do this efficiently. Read the situation. And, and get right into it in terms of practicing. There, this is the monitor progress phase. I'm repeating this to illustrate there's consistency here. This structure, your students will know where you're at always. I've watched this in classrooms. Every student knows what phase they're in. Okay, one is labeled here. 
but there, there's a lot of commonality that gives them a structure to know where they're at, and then they can focus on the skill and what they need to do. Okay? It's a safer program, right? Okay? So generalization, some visuals, some locations where they could use staying calm with others. Finally, the summary. Again, that message, you are in control of staying calm and cool with others. And the, the play on cool is the air conditioning knob, okay? But again, the message is you're in control. There's a self-management theme to this, okay? Finally, uh, then we start lesson two for this staying control. And not surprisingly, we start with visuals. We ask kids, who's staying in control? Who's not staying control, in control in these pictures? So there's that level of engagement. But quickly we move into thinking about emotions. Lessons two is a lot about emotions, and getting kids to log information about how they feel and, um, uh, in, and how they think other people feel. And it's illustrated on their uh, engagement form, how do you feel? or how do I feel and how do others feel in various situations. Continuing that, in the show phase, we have uh, videos, um, and also they can move you into the do phase. I've tried to save time here. And finally, I'm going to end, as I did before, on lesson three. The last slide is about generalization. And really getting kids to think about, okay, we've been through three lessons this week. We spent about 90 minutes together on this skill. Now, you should be very comfortable understanding what the skill is and start thinking about how you can use it in other situations. I, I prompted with this slide, how can you stay calm in these situations? Waiting in line for a ticket and somebody cuts in front of you. Talking with police officers after riding your bike in traffic being bothered by noisy people when at a movie. All of those are, well, at least two of those are fairly typical situations that, that occur in our lives, from young age to even an older age. Um, and we have to think about how can I use this skill that I've worked on to affect my interactions with these people. Okay. There we go. So staying calm with others keeps you safe and happy. Stay cool. Dial it down. Stay cool at home and in school. You are in control. Okay. So now I, I've, I've shared with you two of the ten top ten skills, and the, in doing that, I hope the message is clear. There's a structure: tell, show, do, practice, monitor progress, generalize. There are some predictable aspects to each of those phases. Collectively, we want this to be. Uh, sequenced, S. We want it to be active, A. We want it to be F, focused. We want it to be explicit. And then we want you as a user to think about how this fits best into my school, my classroom. So be responsive. Be, be responsive. Then you do that. You do that for several weeks. Um, if you engage in the, the class-wide intervention core skill aspect, you're likely to be teaching 10 skills over a 10 to 12 or 14 week period. We want you to evaluate your practice. Okay. What would you do to do that? Well, there's a, a, a component you can download. It's called the SEL Edition Intervention Integrity and Outcome Evaluation Report. This is yours, teacher. This is your school psychologist. You're not turning this into the district or anything. This is a tool that prompts you. It's reactive it's to think about the skill steps I know this is hard to see on this slide, but if you go across where the numbers two, two, so are, that's tell, show, do. You're doing a self-rating of how well you applied the skill. A two is if you fully implemented it. A one is you partially implemented it. And a zero is you didn't implement it. And then you can kind of, you get a personal score of how well you did for each of the skills. Okay. In addition, after you've evaluated your integrity or fidelity of implementing it, that you followed the process, then we also want you to think about how well did kids do in this. And so this is a really kind of quick and dirty way. There's other more rigorous ways that I'm going to highlight here in a minute. 
but for you to score, what did you think the unit uh, that you did? So we did the self, uh, we did, excuse me, relationship unit seven, if you look at it. How well did that go with your students? How effective do you think it was? And you can rate it on a four-point scale from not effective to highly effective. Again, this is for your use. We, we encourage users to be self-reflective, to, to do, just as we're asking kids, monitor your progress and make some notes. And you can see in this example, uh, there's some personal notes about managing time, about getting all students to be engaged, et cetera. So that's a pretty easy tool to use. I consider this part of actually the professional development training component to doing the actual intervention, at least for a couple of units. In addition, I haven't talked a lot about this today. There are many other webinars that I have done that you can access on a Pearson site. There are a number of assessment tools that can be useful. In particular, the last one that I've highlighted on the screen called the Screening and Progress Monitoring Scales. These are all, this is a very important point, these rating scales can be completed by teachers and by students, and they are all aligned content-wise with what was taught, okay? Very important, this, this differentiates the SSIS products from all other SEL products. We, what is taught is also what's assessed. So you have this alignment. So not only is they are aligned with the content standard of capsule, the assessment forms are aligned with the content of what's taught. So you, you get a very clean measure, very little error in your measurement of what you're teaching and how well it is going. Okay, and um, there's going to be a new website that, in partnership with Pearson, that gives you even more details about good assessment practices, alignment with intervention, and a number of other intervention resources free of charge beyond those that you purchase when you buy the unit. So this picture kind of pulls it all together. I know we're getting close to being out of time, so I want to be respectful of your time. But the message here is we want to measure progress. It's essential in terms of a quality intervention. In fact, I don't consider You've done an intervention if you haven't measured how well the intervention went. You need to know. You know that as a teacher. Anything you teach, you need to get a sense of, did the kids learn this? Was I effective at doing this? So in this slide, I'm illustrating a page from that progress monitoring tool. It's a very simple rubric. It's a criterion reference rubric. I encourage you to use the paper version, or you can use the online version. Get some very powerful feedback and uh, reports from that. But if nothing more, you can use a different colored pen or pay, uh, and, and, and actually use that to, to, to get a, a picture of progress. You can also use criterion, excuse me, norm reference assessment tools uh, for teachers and students. And, of course, you already have built into every single lesson three times for each unit, 30 times across the core 10, you're getting a sense of progress from students, their self-perceptions can be quite useful in giving you a sense of, in general, how well kids are learning, how well they perceive themselves to be learning. Okay? As I said, if you use the, the screening and progress monitoring tool and you use the um, Pearson's Review 360 uh, software, you get some very colorful, as illustrated here, and very powerful reports that give you a sense of proficiency using our, the very popular stoplight sort of coloration. And um, you get illustrated here, this could be considered a school-wide report where you get data on third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders. And then you get an overall social competency rating, um, as well as breakdown by those five competency components of the capsule framework. So this is, without going into detail today, because we're focusing on teaching this, there are many other uh, webinars I've said that could actually take you into great detail about how this assessment can be used further to advance um, your, your programmatic efforts and your accountability efforts in your school. Um, I think um, you'll find that if you want to, you could use it prior to teaching 
the 10 SIP skills and, and after. So that's what's illustrated here. In effect, you get a time one, time two, time one on the right, first administration, time two on your left, second administration. And this is breaking it down where you get a, what we call an at-risk report, and it shows how students, anytime you see uh, yellow or red, you know there's some problems in the pie. The legend is down in the lower left-hand corner. So if you look at uh, uh, Sabrina Jeffries here, uh, you can see in terms of social or emotional competency, there were three areas, okay, self-awareness, uh, responsible decision-making, and a social awareness that are in the red zone. But you can see after intervention, progress was made um, on four, in four areas, uh, actually a little slippage back in, in terms of self-management according to the rating here. Anyway, this is the, a sense that there are detailed ways to monitor the effectiveness of teaching your top 10 skills or other skills beyond the top 10. And when you use these assessments, any one of them can generate for you detailed information about your class and using that stoplight coloration characterization again in, in the five areas of competencies, it can signal the area, relationship skills in this example, and the skill units that of the 30 skill units that are aligned with that. And so you can see get along with others, but there are additional five other relationship skill units that you can teach using the exact same framework of tell, show, do, et cetera. Okay? So to wrap up, a couple of things that I want to highlight. Okay? I appreciate you listening today. I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that, that I've given you something that you can take away, if nothing more, the notion that you have power, you're already teaching many important behaviors, just the very standing up in front of the class and taking charge. But from the perspective of the class-wide intervention program, I want you to remember, assessments are aligned with instruction. So what you assess is what you teach. I've emphasized today largely of what we teach. Um, it's manualized, okay, 30 skills, and digitized, um, so that it's all available online. You're not lugging a lot of paper around. You're not burning, killing a tree to teach this program. And importantly, these pieces come together to form a safer, sequenced, active, uh, focused, explicit, and responsive curriculum. It's customizable, okay? You can add pictures to the students. You can uh, uh, modify role plays. These are things that make this, I think, more authentic and responsive to your student. It's proven effective. Okay, independent research has shown this to, to result in uh, uh, noticeable effects in terms of three areas, SEL skills, problem behaviors, and academics. And I'll leave you on time today, on time, um, that this is a time-efficient program. If you will invest 2% of the 70,000 minutes of instructional time, only 2%, so about 1,250 minutes of instructional time and, and, and professional development time, you can do the SIP program, okay? It'll be safer, it'll be simplified, and I'm pretty confident it'll be effective. So with that, I want to thank you for taking time today. I'll leave you with this list of references to the various resource materials and, and, art, and articles, research articles that were cited in this presentation. Um, and I, I, I encourage you, if you're at all interested in what I presented today, to go to the Pearson website and look at some of the other webinars that have been presented um, that will take you further down the path of understanding this aligned, this powerful aligned, uh, but yet time efficient program. So thanks. Thumbs up. Have a great school year, guys. Take good care.